I can tell you that every patient I've seen when they walk through the door come with a story. Hi, Dr. May. Uh, it's really nice to meet you today. Uh, I'm Wu Chun, and um, I'm a singer, an actor, and um, I'm also an entrepreneur, and I'm a father to two kids. Well, it's great to meet you, and I'm May Abdel Wahab. I'm a radiation oncologist, so I treat cancer. And uh, right now, I'm the director of the Division of Human Health at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And previously, I, was, I worked for the Cleveland Clinic as a professor and NCI uh, Cairo. So Chun, I wanted to ask you something that's, that's really um, impactful for everybody. Uh, a healthy lifestyle really affects not only the incidence of cancer, but all non-communicable diseases and, and such. And what I wondered is, you are the founder of the Fitness Zone and you're a well-known personality in your country and around the world and continue to organize charity sporting events. So in those things, what role are you playing uh, in terms of the message that you're, you're giving to, to people around the world? Um, you know, as a celebrity, I feel like um, there's a big responsibility like, to do my best to inspire and educate my fans and the public as well. Um, you know, I've been through a lot when my mom got cancer and I know how important a, a good quality of life is to everyone. So I strongly believe that you know, we can all make it happen by practicing a healthy lifestyle starting today. You know, sometimes I know it's quite challenging, you know, but we got to focus on the end goal. I think like it doesn't matter even if you are only influencing one person, two or five, you know, because once you influence someone to do something good, then they will influence other people as well. So, um you really can't measure, you know, it just grows in number and that's how I think miracles happen. That's wonderful. I mean, it's always that ripple effect and, and, yeah. and points of light, I call it, that come out of places and then suddenly you see a lot of light. So yeah. that's, that right. makes sense. But how, how do you, do you find that a lot of people, especially young people, feel that uh, illness and death is so far away from them? And, um, how do is it, is it difficult to get that message because you know we all went through it at some point when you think that it's it won't affect you and it does affect everybody whether it's for a family member a parent yourself you know it, it does so how do you how do you get that message yeah i think this happened especially to the young people you know but for me right i think that life is more than vulnerable as ever you know as we all know right now the world is like in the back shack, you know, and we are undergoing a pandemic right now. And I think life could just be gone that easy, you know, and good health is the, is the ultimate weapon to fight any kind of illness. We also need to know that when we become really ill, I think the people around us are the one who suffers the most. So, you know, it's true. I really hope, you know, to send out the message that all of us had the ability to increase our chances against cancer. That's wonderful. Very, very true. You know, when, when most people think of atomic energy, you know, most people don't think of it like it's helping to fight cancer. So can you explain what role the International Agency for Atomic Energy plays when it comes to cancer? So basically, there's the atomic energy in general, but then there's a, a definite mandate for atoms for peace. So oh. what that means is we use um, radio radiation, nuclear um, applications to be able to treat cancer, for example. Uh, radiotherapy is a very good example. Radiotherapy uses x-rays to treat cancer or gamma rays, and 50 to 70% of cancer patients need radiation at some point in their lives. Wow. Um, so the, the issue is that many people um, are not as familiar with the treatment. It requires a lot of technical expertise and support. And some countries don't even have access. So if people get cancer, they can't even get treated. So all of these factors um, lead us to, to, to try very hard to fill in that gap, to support 
countries and centers around the world to be able to to um, to have this technology, to support this technology, and have it uh, of of good quality. And also, of course, training people on the ground. You know, education is so important, and training is so important. And we we don't have enough doctors and therapists um, and medical physicists on the ground. So the IAA does help to to produce that. And mm. once everything is there, to improve the quality of treatment that's being given. Yeah, definitely. Because I think that training is very important to give out like good quality uh, treatment, right? Especially for all the staff, the nurses, the doctors. Your background is in radiation oncology, right? So what made you interested in this area? So I would say that I, was, I became interested in radiation oncology back when I was about 13 years old, believe it or oh, not. Wow. 13 years old. <laughs> How come? Yeah. If my great grandfather was um, had started the first radiotherapy center. Uh, it was cobalt sixty at the time, and I was always surrounded by that thinking. But uh, but in, when I was thirteen, we were in Washington D.C. and we had this, I guess, diplomatic you know uh, event, and we had people from um, uh, radiation oncologists and other cancer doctors there, and they were having these discussions together, and I was very excited by the, the the breadth of the knowledge and the and the opportunity to change things and uh, and I thought that would be a very interesting area that I would like to consider um, as time went by of course just like everybody else you start having people you know that you care about that that have uh, cancer and need treatment and and so many experiences that add to the urgency of, of this of this kind of area of treatment um, and I know that your your mom, as you said, passed away from from breast cancer uh, in 2002, and I'm very s sorry about that. It's okay. one of those things that's life's changing, and it's so close to home. Yep. So, um, what did you learn from that battle, uh, and and how did it affect you? Um, I think my mom's battle with cancer, right, really changed how I see the world. You know, you see when I'm a member of the family gets cancer. It's like, it's like everyone has the disease, you know, because it's so crippling and then it changes the family dynamics. You mm -hmm. are forced to, to learn new ways of living to accommodate with the change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with cancer, it's like, it's like a learning experience for everyone. It taught me to appreciate life, you know. It led me to an understanding that this word we fear cancer you know or the big c you know can be overcome by even you know a bigger c which is courage you know and that's one of the i think that's one of the greatest gift my mom gave me before she passed away and so from then on i really hope that i can make a change and then to create awareness so absolutely yeah. i think we've come a long way for sure uh, but i think we still have a long way to go and it's really important to have advocates across our societies to be able to move forward in this area. Mm. As you said, I mean, sometimes until something affects you personally, if you haven't had that experience, it's very difficult to understand the depth of what, what it means, you know? Oh, and right. I think for you, having that experience definitely is, is, is quite unique and has, has made that very like central in, in your, in your uh, initiatives. I just want to ask you, like, have you had any, like, direct or close experience with cancer? Like, did that affect your choice to work in cancer? So, just like everybody around the world, I mean, I don't think in this day and age there's anyone who hasn't been affected in some way, whether it's a loved one, a family member, oneself. So, yes, I've had uh, experiences through family with, with cancer similar to you. And definitely um, it, it adds to it. But I can tell you that every patient I've seen when they walk through the door come with a story. And yeah. getting to know people, whoever they are, or whatever they ha whether they're uh, part of the family or part of the bigger global family, mm -hmm. it affects you. And every time we are able to conquer a cancer, we're excited and happy. And every time we lose a patient or a person close to us, it gives us the incentive to keep working harder to try to change things. So it's a passion and a belief 
that will not change with time. I've been practicing for over 35 years and, and this has not changed. Actually, it's gotten bigger in, inside yeah, the passion, of me. Right, the passion to help people. Yeah. yeah, the passion to overcome this, the passion to find solutions, the passion yeah. to support the people who are going through hardship, you know? Hmm. I think that, yeah. that's really important. And yeah, I, I also know that you decided to move from practicing as a radiation oncologist in Cleveland to Vienna. So what made you make this decision? So that wasn't an easy decision. So this was the next step in trying to expand what one can do on the ground. So if you help one country and set up one center, mm. you're treating thousands of people and you can change thousands of people's yep. lives more. So that was the, the reason I want, I felt like I wanted to ha to try to expand, you know, out and reach out to more people somehow. Yeah, and doing so, exactly, yeah. very similar to what you're doing, right? In, in moving, mm -hmm. in, you know, being an ambassador to, to these cancer organizations, I think it, it even promotes the message more and helps us do our job better. And you're also an ambassador for a number of cancer related organizations. So have you learned anything from that experience that was different from your experience with your mother? Um, for me, I think, first of all, I'm, I'm very privileged, you know, to be appointed on this meaningful role, you know, and recently I also get the opportunity to tour the facilities at our Brunei National Cancer Center. And then I had a good chat with some of the, the oncologist doctors in our country. And from then I came to understand that, you know, every year, there are new breakthroughs in oncology research. So it's interesting that you mention the Brunei Cancer Center since that was my very first visit as director of the Division of Human Health was to that center. It was my very oh, first <laughs> travel and I was really impressed. Brunei. Yes, yes, of course. Oh, okay. uh, it, it was lovely. What a beautiful country and lovely people. Thank you. And when I, was that? I, so, I'm sorry, when was when that? Was it was it was in 2014. It oh, was my first no. trip after joining the IAEA. And right. to that specific cancer center, it has just, just opened. And we had, we, you know, and we continue to work with them uh, as of today as well. So I'm glad to hear that you visited there too. Yeah, I know. Thank you. You know, actually in Brunei, right, we are, we are proud to say that, you know, the facilities that we have in terms of like medical care, including cancer, are all free. And, yes. But I think the main challenge is the public's perception. So I think my job as an ambassador, I think, is to educate the public, not just about cancer, but also on the treatment modalities. You no, know, it's not just about creating awareness on what yes. cancer can be detected and prevented, but also creating the the full spectrum about cancer. So from detection to diagnosis to treatment, and how all this can help to reduce the number of premature death and long-term effects of consequences from cancer. So hopefully in the long term, you know, it will prevent and reduce the incidence of cancer. That's, that's, that's a very good point. And, and for us, we really work on prevention, diagnosis, treatment, mm -hmm. and all the way to palliation. So it's really important for us to address all the different aspects of it, that that is one of the most important things. It's a spectrum and we need to learn how to move across the spectrum and still support people, whichever, whichever stage they are in the process. You are also a member of the United Nations Joint Program on the Cervical Cancer Control uh, Steering Committee. So what do you think of the recent global strategy to eliminate cervical cancer? So I think that it's, it's wonderful that we have a leadership right now that is promoting um, this cancer service elimination and the strategy that, that, um, that will hopefully save women's lives as, uh, and eliminate cervical cancer is an extremely important, not just from a medical perspective, but from a social equity and, and uh, perspective. So um, I think that, that this cervical cancer elimination strategy uh, will actually lead to significant effect. It, it will be a, a tidal wave of change that can happen as long as we all work together. 
and read from the same script. So we don't have silos, so everybody can work together better. Now the next step, of course, is the bigger cervical cancer elimination strategy that all countries in the world and all groups can participate in. That's like giving a big hope to everyone. Yes, uh, yeah. and it's a very good example of how if, the, if all of us work together, we can achieve much more than, than a single groups working alone. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've seen, you know, from the way you talk, from all the things that you share, right, I can see that you are very passionate, you know, like you're hungry for more. And yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think your mom would think of all that you're doing? Um, I think, you know, although my mom lost a battle against cancer, I think this, this painful experience has given me, you know, the kind of extraordinary power to transform this negative experience into something very positive, you know. It's the most important wake-up call for me. And it really taught me that health is true wealth and we should learn to cherish life before it gets too late. She's also the one who, who guide me into giving back to the community since I was a kid. So I believe like she will be very happy to see what I'm doing right now, especially that, you know, I'm a celebrity who has that little influence to make a change. Um, I do believe that if we as a world community stand together, as I said before, the ripple effect can be significant and we can really change things. So, um, Dr. May, um, you were included in the best doctors in America listing at one time. So what does it mean to be a good doctor today, uh, particularly doctors working with people living with cancer? So I think being a good doctor today is very similar to being a good doctor at in any uh, age, it's about caring for patients and caring for humanity in general and being able to do the most that you can to be able to support people. I think that um, the, the privilege of being privy to, to people's inner fears and, and need of support and being there at the time in, in people's lives where it could be most challenging for them is, is something that, that gives us uh, the, the passion to want to intervene and, and, and support others uh, around the world and, and our patients. So uh, being a physician is basically trying to alleviate some of the suffering, whether it's emotional or physical suffering, and to try to support our fellow human beings through a time that's difficult for them. Of course, there are challenges today that might not have been as, as prominent, let's say, 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. I would say the, um, the lack of resources in some situations where there isn't enough money to cover treating everybody. So you have some people who are not able to access the treatment. And all of that is, is problematic sometimes. Tell me a little bit about your advocating for breast and cervical cancer and how, um, how that is in terms of women's issues and, and do you find any challenges in that process or are you able to you know, engage very easily with, with these issues? But you know, as a man you know, advocating for women's health issues, I think, I think it's, it's a game changer. You know? <laughs> I want to show an example that, hey, you know, we are in this together, no matter what gender it is. When we support each other, I think one gender shouldn't be a barrier, but in fact, it opens to diversity and a strong message that we are in this fight together. So I love that because, because the belief that we are one community, one world, humanity, regardless of any differences, including gender, um, yeah. the individual is the same. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we have to do it together. We are a family, a human family. And if everybody carries a little bit of the load, we will definitely move farther than if each one were trying to do it on their own.